My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And my name's Tom Scholey. Man, before we get into New Gods number seven, Tom, what do you have up front? Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. It's the story of Jack Kirby's whole life. This is, uh, you know, everything that ever happened to him and every comic he ever invented. I've heard of him. In, store, in, in finders and <laughs> bookstores now. now. Jim. Join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see how I make the comics I make. Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Alive, available now. Still in print from Image Comics. You can get this in any comic shop or bookstore wherever you buy your graphic novels and comics. And you can see how I made it on patreon.com slash jimrug. K Fabers, you made Red Room a hit, and we have tangible goods to show off now, man. Uh, every month, there's going to be a fresh issue. Got to thank you guys very, very much. If you want to pre-order this stuff, hit my link tree in the description below. If you want to read the comics, hit up uh, the link tree in the description below. Hit, go to my Patreon. Put new strips up every Tuesday. Now that that's out of the way, Tom, welcome back to the channel. Yeah, it's for good a to be back. Uh, when uh, we were talking last week, it was like. Tom, choose a couple of comics and let's let's uh, get your ass over here and let's get busy. Chose New Gods number seven and uh, Mister Miracle number nine. The the Franklin Mint twins twin sets. <laughs> yes. Uh, New Gods number seven came up a couple of times in shoot interviews. Uh, Rick Veach, uh, I think Brendan McCarthy might have uh, brought it up, and uh, I was excited to bust this comic back open. What makes it so special, Tom? Okay, well, this, I mean, this right here is the Baxter reprint, and this is the form of this story that I first encountered and, and you know, read for years and years. And um, it just, like, this was at the beginning of my Jack Kirby journey. And, um, like, this this comic just kind of, it, it, it fell in my lap, and it was, like, everything I'd ever been looking for from just, like, entertainment in general. It's kind of, it's kind of like... Um, it's like, like, you know, growing up on, like, Star Wars and stuff, it's like Star Wars, except with, like, the volume turned up, mm -hmm. and then growing up with superheroes, it's like, you know, it's it's superheroes, it's it's religion, it's basically, like, you know, it speaks directly to me, and I assumed that um, anybody else who got this comic handed to them would have, like, the exact same reaction, so then, like, just the rest of my life was kind of like growing disappointment of like meeting people who like just didn't get it. Who were like, well, what, what's, what, what are you talking about? But this, like, to me, this is like, you know, the, the greatest piece of art that like humanity's ever produced. And it's an origin of the conflict of Apocalypse and New Genesis, right? right. And the, uh, I don't know if attempt at peace is the right way to, to, to mm -hmm. describe it, but these two leaders swap their children, their firstborn, in order to sort of create this, I don't know, ongoing a cold war s synergy between them, yeah, know, intertwining yeah. their fates. Right. It's it is basically like how um, you know the marriage between different like feudal houses would have been. It, it kind of makes a a blood link between right. the various uh, you know warring houses, and yeah, it's just like every page, every panel is like a completely new character, a completely new environment, a completely new vehicle, invention, conflict. Um, it's it's like you know like like pound for pound like like you're you're seeing just like an entire universe being created in the course of like twenty four pages and it just doesn't stop. And you just kinda want it to go on forever. And since this was so early in my like Jack Kirby journey, I assumed there were like hundreds of comics exactly like you know that that like like this is this is like the starting point for what comics is. I didn't realize it was like the height that, it, <laughs> that it's all downhill from here. Yeah, there's even this piece right here from time to time. Uh, this kind of segment uh, will supplement the larger tapestry of the new gods, if only, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and so this um, th this like was kind of referred to as a tapestry issue because of that quote, and then. Uh, Mr. Miracle number nine, Hyman, was, is, is like the companion piece, as you'd mentioned earlier. Um, and like this just standing alone is just so incredible. It's it's um, you get this like linkage of relationships between every character that's in it. Uh, and like the baton just keeps getting handed off from character to character as you move through this like very complicated, very different world than the one we know. And but but if you can also think of it within the context of the series it was in. This is issue seven of an ongoing series, and then technically, like, I don't know, like, issue 21 of, like, the three, you know, uh, Mr. Miracle, Forever People, and New Gods. So you're pretty far into the story, and now you're getting, like, an origin. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the thing you could compare it to is, like, the Star Wars prequels or whatever. Yeah. 
And like just thinking about how this functions, you know, like compared to like the Star Wars prequels, um, you're 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 in this story, and every character, every like preconception you had about these characters up to this point is turned on its head. Sure. And it's not like turned on its head in some kind of cheap shock trick kind of thing. Like these these um, twists actually like deepen your understanding of these characters, and and even though they're like surprising. They make sense, you know. Like it, it, it's, um, it, it, you know, it's just like this is this is what like this is what you would want a a you know prequel or whatever to be. Like, there's, yeah. There's some good there's some good uh, hero's journey stuff in here because mm-hmm. when you see High Father in the the early comics, kind of a Buddhist, mm-hmm. kind kind of chill, and uh, it's his origin story. Yeah, and it's shocking. Like you don't recognize him at first. You right. think he's a completely different character. In fact, if you were to guess, like, oh, which guys father is this or you might even think calabac right you know? yeah sure yeah certainly with that uh that facial hair right and yet like um and and, and kirby kind of continued this trend like throughout the series of where like whenever you thought you had this series and the characters figured out he'd kind of pulled the rug out from under you but yeah like you said um you know high father was was you know like a buddha he was kind of like the closest thing to like a you know uh biblical mosaic god kind of thing you know he was just like you know, holy and, and, and all about peace. And yeah, when he was younger, he was this, you know, hot blooded warrior. And, and just like the lessons in here are are kind of like amazing. Like that, that, you know, he learns that like, you know, war and, and violence, um, you, you, you end up destroying yourself ultimately and everything around you. And, and that, and that he's playing into the hands of this sort of master manipulator and like dark side, the surprises you kind of get from him, uh, people think of him as this sort of like this like all powerful you know um, uh, you know god of evil who's just like unstoppable doesn't question himself but but you you learn something about him and about the nature of bullies uh, the nature of of fascists that he is actually like a very scared individual and like that's why he uh, feels the need to just control every aspect of his life and then every aspect of the universe and when he starts out there's this like off camera voice of like careful uncle you know things like you know be careful he's one of the new genesis's leaders and you're like who's this like sniveling twerp in the background who's who's you know g- you know goading his uncle but then you know acting like he's not goading him and then he steps out of the shadows and it's dark side that uh you know obscure and humble dark side um and, and that 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 it's kind of like this is this is sort of how you know like this type of a person functions in real life too, where they kind of, they play whatever role they need to play in whatever situation. So he's like the, you know, the, the shrinking violet in the background, but then putting kind of like evil thoughts in his uncle's head. And then when his uncle like, you know, kills, uh, Avia, he's like, Oh, uncle, you weren't supposed to do that. You know, shame mm-hmm. on you. And, 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 and then, uh, you know, and, and this is all part of like a larger manipulation to start a war. It's just like, you know, Jack Kirby, you see Jack Kirby's life experience here. He's, He's a, a middle-aged man at this point, and it's just, like, every uh, person he's ever met, every, like, you know, every every war he's ever uh, fought in, you're, you're just seeing that, like, experience playing out here. It's an interesting perspective to bring to it, because we think of so much of Kirby's experience influenced by his World War II, uh, you know, life, but years later, you know, it's it's still clinging to him. It's still reflecting on him. But his stories evolve as his probably perception of those events change over time, even though it's still definitely fixated on that conflict and on these casualties of war and the forces that, you know, manipulate maybe the innocent uh, people that get swept up in the conflicts. It probably took him his entire life to sort of work through that trauma in the form of comic books. Right. Some great art throughout this one, too. Uh, Mike Royer, always a pleasure to see him inking and lettering, you know, like I see several of the sound effects as, as you're flipping through there, Ed, and it's like, these panels remind me so much of like a Liechtenstein painting yeah. or something, you know, like so many of them, especially when you have that big sound effect lettering on them, feel like they would look amazing blown up and, you know, painted and maybe the dots enlarged. That stuff really stands out, but then there's lots of those small details too of, of uh, a weathered arm or something, you know, where it just, you feel the weight of a lifetime of war on some of these characters in in the few quiet moments that exist it's uh it's a remarkable epic in its in the size and it's weird you know it's just a comic book like it's the same yes. as every other 
set of, you know, format that everybody else gets to use. For some reason, this one feels gigantic. Yeah, like, just as a creator, like, I kind of puzzle at this, and I'm like, how, like, how do you know how to do this? Because it's, like, all these stories, and then they all kind of, like, stop or segue at, like, the exact right time. Like, like, I would feel like, oh, well, I probably would have, like, stuck around, you know, developed little things better. Like, he just kind of knows where to pop in and pop out. It's, it's, you know, like, his uh, life's experience of, like, working in comics. Like, you know, he's just, like, masterful at this point, and probably not putting very much like conscious thought into it just yeah. letting it flow i was going to ask you if you had some some intel on the, the writing process because it is very tight in that way and i do wonder how much he plans ahead does he write the full script ahead of time does he do thumbnails draw it out quick and dirty on a piece of paper beforehand uh do you have any of those details is that lost to the ages we're gonna go get a mike royer shoot interview <laughs> yeah i mean like uh yeah have have like Mark Evanier over because like that that would be the source of my information on it because he he said like back then like Jack just d didn't work like he didn't do thumbnails like all that stuff you listed he didn't do he didn't do pre-writing now on this particular series he did a, a lot of sort of like informal planning like this was in the hopper since like maybe 66 67 when he was at his height at Marvel, doing amazing stuff, but feeling like, you know, he's not getting the proper credit or compensation. And so, but this was something he was working on for Marvel. So he had like some form of these characters in mind, uh, you know, some form of, of, of these stories, but nothing, nothing was really set in stone or on paper or, or in a note, but of, uh, that's some of the weariness that I'm talking yeah. about in these characters and in the marks that are applied to them. And then that's just a dazzling panel as mm -hmm. the borders fall away and he's fooling around, you know, some of the formal elements there. Very well, effective graphics. Um, I just wrote the introduction for volume two of like the absolute fourth world. And um, I, talk, I talk a lot about this issue in there because it's got like that second volume has like all the best stuff. Like a couple of the best things are in volume one, <laughs> but then this has like all the best stuff. And it's like... Kirby draws um, wreckage better than anybody. And in this part of the story, New Genesis, this sort of like paradise world that we've seen up to this point, is turning into apocalypse. Dark side is turning New Genesis into apocalypse. And um, more directly, High Father Isaiah the Inheritor is turning his his world into apocalypse. And the you know, the planet apocalypse looks like Dark side's cratered, you know, festering right. face. And now New Genesis is starting to look that way. And High Father 2 is starting to get all the cracks and fissures. And, you know, he's he's kind of turning into Dark Side too. It's a really good detail. <clears throat> Whenever uh, Dean Haspel would be drawing American Splendor strips, he always said, you just draw Dark Side without the blue <laughs> helmet on. <laughs> you kind of see it right there. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> Look at our little dude, man. This is the this is the stuff that I always remember from this yes. issue. Yeah, and and like if if you were reading the original issue, uh, the original printing, uh, the colorist like misinterpreted this as like a skull cap. So he's got like this white skull cap, and but you know, but fortunately it's been corrected in in this and and subsequent volumes. This this sequence always like kills me. It like it like floors me, like the emotion of it and stuff, and this this like little kid who's like maybe never met his father and he's like are you my father because if you are i'm gonna fuck you up you know <laughs> and, and 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 just and um high father is like so uh in the throes of grief that he's almost kind of like yeah go ahead and do it you know and 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 it just it's this like perfect moment that kind of like bonds these two characters for the rest of their uh, their lives it's like oh this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship and like you know um just like what what you've read of the series so far um, you know, Orion is High Father's right hand, and um, you know, just the, like as 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 a kid reading this comic, I assumed like every other comic, it went on for a million issues. So it's like, oh yeah, like these two, like these are this is like a famous pair in com this is like Batman and Robin, except not realizing that like you know I just had like a couple more issues to go and the whole thing's over. I try to think about it in context of the people who were reading it at the time, and to kind of get stopped in your tracks and, and have this this prelude story must have been a fascinating reading experience because everything was, you know, up to the minute beforehand and now you have this pause break 
and and get some backstory on you know the origin of of the world and shit I, that's just that's a very cool uh transition and ride to take the readers on i feel like i love that it's not issue one's the origin right, right? i get so uninterested yes. in these origins of characters that i don't know why do i care to do it in the middle after you've read about these characters and seen some of their interactions and figure out who they are, it has so much more weight than if you just did, oh, this is issue one. Yeah, it, it works. You don't know any of these characters. It works precisely for that reason. I think and so. It's also, it's it's more literary because comics is like, oh yeah, okay, issue one, origin. But in, you know, like literature, it's kind of, there's digressions and, and you know, all kinds Also of in stuff. real life. In like real, when you exactly. meet somebody at a party, the first thing you do is not trade backstories. Yes. <laughs> source really cool. uh, panel, a couple pages yes. back yeah, the end. That's the one that um, I, I believe came up in several of our shoot interviews. And I can't remember now at this point who's saying what. But, but I, I think like the Rick Veach uh, interview or the Brennan McCarthy or Steve Bissett. Um, I remembered like them mm -hmm. discussing this this specific panel in some of those, and it's uh, it's interesting the uh, like the meta elements of Kirby's storytelling, like the awareness of story as like this human culture piece, and I feel like that kind of panel encapsulates that. You know, it's something that we would see people doing in postmodernism and in meta storytelling, but in this case, it's like Kirby already. Of course, he's doing it in the in the early seventies. Yeah, if if I am Isaiah the inheritor, what is my inheritance? Now, now uh, what do you mean? But you mean sort of the the graphic quality of like it's a finger, like almost like a Kirby self portrait, like like I'm the finger moving, and here you know here's my words, yes. and here's my drawing board is this uh, monolith, it the feels, source wall. Yeah, it feels very biblical in that way. You know, mm -hmm. like there are several of these biblical stories of text being you know carved in stone, written in fire, you know, given to man or whatever by these higher beings, and in a way like. It's new gods. Like, mm -hmm. of course, the gods are doing this this sort of giant. You know, they're not writing on paper. Um, I think it's kind of a cool a cool idea that he puts in there. And again, something that I think comics have embraced more and more. Say maybe in the eighties and nineties, but it's pretty early on to be thinking that way. Yeah, he's so ahead of the curve, and I think that's the, like the reason why. Like when 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 this comic you know came out. People weren't like, oh, yeah, this is like it wasn't like, OK, this is how we're going to do comics. now. Like we look at it now and it makes total sense. Like I think this comic makes more sense in 2021 than it did in you know 1971 or whatever. I think whatever. that's very true. OMAC had that quality when we gave it a read not too long ago. This is interesting drawing, too. This yes. is another one of those pieces that's kind of a really strange bit of drawing mm -hmm. within the context of comics. You know, like like what what does this represent? You know, what, how are you thinking this way? Uh, pretty inventive for a guy who's, you know, been in the game for 30 years or something at this point and is still doing things that other comics have not started doing. Yeah, it feels cutting edge. It It is um, tied more to, like, the, you know, graphic design of that period than it is tied to comics. Right. Yeah, well said. Super fun to read, man. Pleasure to revisit. And Tom, it's good to have you back uh, in the house. Do you guys have anything else about New Gods number seven? Well, I mean, just just one real quick note. Like, it's been reprinted several times, and uh, you know, it's just funny the things with the coloring. But um, I've spoken to a couple of people who interpret that that flaming uh, hand, sort of like the hand from like the Ruby out of Omar Khayyam. Uh, some people have it interpreted it as being uh, Isaiah's hand that Isaiah wrote the source in the wall. That never occurred to me at all until I talked to some people who had that experience. But whoever did the recoloring in this like pretty recent uh, volume interpreted it the same way. So it's, it's, it's red here and then it's flesh colored right. here. And either way works in story. Like it's kind of like Kirby's bulletproof. You know, they talk about how like anybody, you know, you can't destroy Kirby. And like, that's kind of a cool interpretation too. I still, I like, I I know Kirby's intent was the flaming flying hand, that, and 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 that works one way. But this this is an interesting other other way that this story also can resonate and work. Man, now it makes me wonder how you, you give that colorist credit for making this narrative choice, and I just wonder like, man, the way these reprints are handled, I'd be surprised if that much thought went into it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I hope you're right. Well, I love he, thinking of it that way. I mean, here's how comics works. Here's how Jack Kirby worked. Here's how, uh, you know, you and me work. It's like, you're doing this stuff at, as fast as you can. You know, you need to get this stuff out. So you're not thinking, but like your gut is thinking, your subconscious. So like, I, I, I think that the 
colorist probably spent as much time thinking about this as Jack Kirby did. And like, <laughs> you know, the, and, and that was, that was the choice that his, um, you know, internal, uh, gu gui guidance came up with was, was that he's writing this himself. That's his hand. I'm Who glad you point that out. Okay, Fabers, whose hand is it? <laughs> let's, let's get out of here, guys. Uh, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg is where you can join me to see how I make comics. You can see my new uh, original art and what I'm working on, uh, at least as soon as I'm able to announce what I'm working on. But Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg is where you go for all of that. Would you say that was again, Jim? <laughs> no? No? Um, yeah, I uh, like I mentioned, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Learn the story behind this story. I have a Patreon also. Uh, just go on Patreon.com, search my name, Tom Scholey. And I'm you know creating comics there and, and posting them as I create them. I've done a couple of comics that, um, like for legal reasons, I can't say are... Uh, you know, my own, like, uh, off-book New Gods <laughs> comics, but but there you have it. I was looking on an app uh, not not too long ago, the Key Collectors app, and your Final Frontier uh, mini-comic, going for $100. Hey, it, it is legitimately rare. I, I stapled <laughs> every copy of that book, so I know how many of them are out there. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where you can read the Red Room comics ahead of time. Uh, you can pre-order them uh, through my link tree at the Fantagraphics website in the uh, description below this video and once again got to thank you guys for making red room a hit go out go to your comic shop pick up the book what else jim you can subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on and coming out in 2021 you can also find cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video every time i read a jack kirby comic i'm juiced up to get back to the board get busy make comics jimmy give these guys their margin orders we're going to be on our way read more comics <laughs>